talked about my hospital birth, but I didn't really get to delve into my home birth experience. So that's really what I wanna to do today. So one of the things that I will say, I hadn't mentioned this the last time, was the scheduling of the induction for the baby. So oftentimes what tends to happen is that when we as women are when we're pregnant and we go to an OB and begin to do all of our routine checkups for the pregnancy, um, right around like 32 to 35 weeks, they wanted to already schedule uh, my induction. So that just to explain that that pretty that pretty much means if the baby is not here by week 41, then we're gonna go ahead and induce you to provoke the labor. And I do recall that when the doctor had told me that because of all of the research that I had done, I denied scheduling. Of course, people looked at me like, are you crazy? They tried to scare me into, in, into doing it with the whole, there may not be any hospital beds available for you unless you do it during this time. Um, you know, let's try to get you in just in case. I said, nope, don't wanna do it. My baby will come when she's ready. So this is, this is one of the biggest things, guys. One of the biggest things here is that whenever you are being told that you have to schedule an induction at 41 weeks, if you are not an at-risk patient, if you're not an at-risk mother, you are fine waiting until the baby is ready to come, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna tell you why. Really, delivery, you are in the safe zone when it comes to delivery between 37, 38 weeks to about 42 weeks. So oftentimes, the reason why the window is as wide as it is is because you have to remember, when they give you that due date, you know, we all tend to go by this due date and like we glorify the idea of this due date. But only 2% of babies are actually born on their due date. And that's because that due date really just is an estimation based on the woman's last day of her last menstrual cycle. So they're really taking a guess based off of that on the window that you probably conceived. And so at that point, like, yeah, so you this this estimated date could be too far out. It could be too far in. So this is why that 37 and a half to 42 week mark is considered safe, a safe period for delivery. And any woman who is currently um, not at risk when it comes to delivering, I'm not saying that this is what you have to do, but what I am saying is, you do not have to go ahead and schedule an induction. You don't. You definitely do not have to schedule an induction. There will be a hospital bed available for you. You know, you wanna know how I know that? Because whenever we do, I mean, if, if people were to go to the hospital for emergencies, where are they gonna put them? So I'm like, yes, if I was to roll up at 40 weeks, like, would you have a hospital bed for me then? I mean, I'm scheduling the induction at 41 weeks, but what if I come sooner? Are you gonna tell me I don't have a hospital bed then? You see what I'm saying? So you do not have to schedule the induction. Now, the, the second thing is, if you did schedule the induction, either you're already a mother who, like you're thinking, uh, like you're currently planning to get pregnant, you're, um, you currently are pregnant, um, you know, you, you want to get pregnant in the future and be a mother, whatever the case might be, you already went through this, you'll definitely, if you already went through this, you'll know what I'm talking about, but wherever you currently are in the journey, this is great information for you as a woman to know, especially if one day you are expecting to have children, okay? When it comes to induction, you need to beware, all right, especially especially if you are a woman of low risk. You are not an at-risk patient. When it comes to scheduling an induction date, you need to beware, all right? Why? Because oftentimes what is happening in those inductions, what that 
what that means is that they are going to inject you with Pitocin to provoke the labor, all right? So when Pitocin is injected, this is a chemical inducer. So it's not natural, it's a chemical inducer to provoke the contractions and to provoke the labor so that you will have uh, the baby sooner because you know it's okay it's 41 weeks why hasn't baby why hasn't baby come yet let's just to be safe let's go ahead inject you with some pitocin and provoke the labor to take place all right here's what they don't tell you because whenever you go to the hospital for that induction date you're signing a whole bunch of paperwork getting a catheter put in you get hooked up to a whole bunch of machines and all you're doing is signing the paperwork, but do you read the fine print? Are you reading the fine print? Here's what they're not telling you. They're telling you we're gonna induce you with Pitocin because we wanna make sure that you survive, the baby survives, all of this stuff. But here's what they're not telling you. What they're not telling you is that there are more risks to you being injected with Pitocin, not just for you, but for the baby. There's greater risk for the child than if you just were to allow the baby to come when the baby was ready. So let me give you some, let me give you some of this, all right? Uh, in Pitocin induced contractions are longer, they are more painful, they are closer together, which means that you don't get the reprise that you get when you are doing natural, uh, when you're going through natural labor. Pitocin causes stress on your child. This is why more often than not, it is very rare, very, very rare that a woman who has Pitocin does not go for an epidural. Why? Because as a chemical inducer, because it is produced with chemicals, it's something that you're injecting into your body, it's not natural. The level of pain that Pitocin produces is not natural pain that you feel in delivery. And because of that, women can't bear it. So because women can't bear this chemical element that's being put into their bodies to induce labor, they call for the epidural. I don't blame you. I don't blame you because with Kalea, I went to the hospital with Kalea exactly at 42 weeks. I refused to have an induction date. I refused. So what we ended up doing because of insurance, again, stuff that they don't tell you, uh, hospitals and doctors can lose out on their paycheck if you go past 42 weeks. So because of that, there are some practices that they legally... it they almost like if they decide to let you go past it's almost like they they're not going to get paid so because of that i was like you know whatever i'll give you the 42 weeks if the baby does not come at 42 weeks i will come into the hospital so that's exactly what happened kalea literally cooked for 41 weeks and six days and she was born on the 42nd week <laughs> But I went to the hospital at the, my 42 weeks. I went to the hospital already with contractions. My contractions were probably about, I want to say, like seven minutes apart. And they weren't super intense. I could bear it. Like, I wasn't in incredible pain. I could still talk through them. Um, it just, it felt uncomfortable at that point. Like, Yes, I'd have to stop to kind of, you know, breathe, catch my breath, but I could keep going. Um, and then I remember that be when I got to the hospital, they wanted to hook me up with all this stuff. I said, no, thank God for my doula who helped me really make sure I had a good birth plan in place. Um, but she let me know, look, there might be some requirements that the hospital is going to have. Tell them, you know, let them at least Put the catheter on you, but tell them that you don't want anything hooked up unless it's totally necessary. So unless you need an IV or whatever the case might be, but just have it ready in the event that it's needed because they may not let you go to the room unless you have it in. So thankfully, the hospital agreed to that because I came in knowing my rights and I said, I don't want 
anything else connected to me. You can put the catheter on me and have it ready, but other than that, I wanna labor freely. So I go into the hospital room, the nurse comes in, talks to my doctor, and um, the doctor was afraid that maybe the labor would go longer than expected, so uh, they went ahead and gave me the lowest dose of Pitocin. I'm talking about this, they said it was the lowest dose. And I'm looking at the machine like, I wanna know that this is the lowest dose. So she shows me, does a little click, and is like, lowest dose, all right? So I'm seeing the, the little droplets going in. I tell you not, within a matter of like, less than two minutes, I'm like hunching over the side of the bed because the pain is getting so strong. I immediately call the nurse. I say, this is too much. I cannot handle it. I do not want the Pitocin. Call the doctor right now. I want to be removed from the Pitocin. So she calls the doctor. Doctor says, you know what? It seems like her labor is progressing. Right at the, about this point, my contractions were already about five minutes apart. She was like, take her off of it. She doesn't need it. Thank God, I only had to deal with the with the Pitocin for I think the most was five minutes because as soon as it kicked in, I was like, get it off me, I don't want it. Um, now that being said, I was then able to progress through the rest of my labor normally. I was in labor with Kalea for about six and a half, close to seven hours before I began to push. And I will tell you, I am so grateful that I had my doula there with me. I am grateful that I had my husband there with me. I was moving around. I was swaying my hips. I was on the side of the bed. I was doing whatever I needed to do. Even though it was a hospital birth, I, I came in knowing my rights and made sure that I, that I was able to do what I needed to do to um, make the labor progress naturally. Now, when the time came for me to push Kalei, I've already talked about that in my first episode, so go ahead and watch the first episode and all of that good stuff to, to learn a little bit more. But here's some of the stuff that I didn't know that I had went over in my birth plan with Amy, who I am so grateful for, because there were, um, if you saw my post from earlier today, one of the things that I had put on there was uh, my comment about whether or not to give my newborn a bath. I was like, huh, I didn't even know that that was an option. <laughs> I thought that like at hospitals, you always gave them a bath. But I learned about that layer of skin. So whenever you guys see babies um, when they're born, Okay, so here's the reality. If you haven't seen a baby when, like literally when the baby comes out of the vaginal canal, they have this kind of white mucus layer all around them, all right? So uh, this white mucus layer that's all around them is called the vernix. And it's a it's this like mucusy, wackusy, um, just like protective layer of, I guess we'll just call it layer of mucus or skin or whatever you wanna call it that's um that's a, it's like a paste it's pasted on them okay now i did not know this then because i'm thinking like okay that must be disgusting when i've seen it you know in videos or in movies that must be disgusting no wonder they're wiping or washing it off and no wonder like the next day making sure like the baby's getting their bath and making sure all of that stuff is removed but after having my conversation with amy and doing a sit down with her i realized this is actually the best thing for my child. And no, I actually don't want you to bathe my baby and I don't want you to rub off the vernix. Why? Because if you didn't know that, guys, that is a germ fighter. It is like an antibacterial wipe <laughs> that is coated around your child. It's protecting your child. It's preventing infection in the child because they are so new to this earth, um, to the world. So it's actually, especially in a hospital setting, a place where germs are flying left and right, the vernix is acting as a coat of protection for the child and it's preventing infection from taking place. It acts as a lubricant so that it makes it easier for the woman to push the baby out. Um, it's protecting the child from any pathogens. It's moisturizing the baby's skin. 
Um, it's it, it has a, a, a sense of it has a, a this newborn smell comes from that from the vernix. And so what tends to happen is even that allows the mother and the child to bond. The levels of protein that are even in the vernix are levels of protein, the same amounts of protein that are even found in her breast milk. So even helping baby latch on. There are just honestly, guys, like the process that God created was well thought out. It is a miracle. There is beauty in in the creation of life. And then in doing all of this research and studying, I think the thing that shocked me the most was in really growing up believing that I needed help to bring life into this planet. That I as a woman didn't have everything that I needed within me to produce life correctly. And so to have done the research and to have studied all of these things and to see the beauty behind all of it, it was, it's, in, it, it's incredible. Like, that being said, I literally waited, I think it was like a whole week before I even bathed my child. And some, and you know, you might be hearing that and you're like, oh my God, that's disgusting. It does not smell. It has this newborn sense of smell. It's natural. Like the reality is you're thinking like, doesn't it smell like your insides? No, it legit has this like newborn um scent and the people who were actually around my child during those first periods and and carried her nobody was like why does she smell like that oh my god everyone literally everyone's words were exactly the same everyone went oh that newborn scent oh my god she smells so good they didn't know i hadn't bathed my baby for five days it's called vernix natural moisturizer created by mama on the inside to protect her child from all of your germs. That's what that is, okay? So now you all know the truth, you know the facts. This is actually a beautiful thing to keep on your child. If you have the option, no, not if you have the option. You have the option. You do not need to bathe your child. Don't let them wipe it off. Let that thing soak in. It usually takes five to six days for um, for the vernix to really soak into the child's skin. So wait for that to fully soak in and then bathe your child for the first time. I promise you they will be okay. I promise you they are not going to stink. I promise you it is not disgusting. Trust me. It's... I, and when you really understand what it's doing for your child, it is the most beautiful thing, all right? So now that being said, let's go on to my actual home birth experience. Because after I had Kalea in the hospital and was like super exhausted and tired and had people coming into my room at all hours of the night, I'm talking about like 9 p.m., then 12 p.m., then 2 in the morning, then 6 a.m., it was like... I left the hospital. I could I could not wait, guys. I could not wait to get my hiney out of the hospital with my child and my husband. I just I was like I I need to get out of here. I think I asked the nurse two times on the second day. We are both healthy. I don't know how much more you need to check. Can I leave? <laughs> and they were like, "No. You have to stay for 3 days. That's the rule. That's you know, that's policy. Why? Because every day that I'm here, you're putting a tab on my bill. I don't have to be here for three days if I am perfectly healthy. And you want to know how I really know that is because now during COVID, they women who are having their babies in the hospital, they are actually recommending them to go home after 24 hours because they are safer at home than they are in the hospital. Really? You just figured that one out? Do you see what I'm saying here, guys? There's a lot of politics behind this stuff. And so this is why I opted 
for home birth, all right? This is why I opted for home birth, because I'd already gone through the experience the first time. I knew that I could do this naturally. I didn't need any medical intervention. I was not an at-risk patient. I was not an at-risk mother. I was healthy, my baby was healthy, all the ultrasounds were, were showing signs of that. So I said, you know what, the second time around, I'm doing this at home, no questions asked. Don't say anything, nobody, nobody, nobody who had told me that I was crazy for doing it, for the thinking about doing it before, I don't wanna hear it, I'm doing my home birth. So now comes Nade, who I did the home birth with. And then I also did the home birth with the third one, which is uh, the, the, my third child, Nevaya, um, recently. And let me just tell you guys, obviously because it was my second time and I was doing this naturally, second and third time doing this naturally, I will say that um, the labor was much shorter. So with Kalea, I was in labor for about six and a half, seven hours pushed. It took about two and a half pushes and she was out. With um, Nade, the labor was a lot shorter. I remember my uh, church had actually put on an event called My Hope Fest, an annual event that we do every year in the community for just as an outreach effort to give back to our community. And I was at this event, I was already, um, Nade, same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, the day that Nade was born, I was also 41 weeks and five days. So I was going on to my sixth day. So <laughs> if Nade hadn't been born by the Sunday, on Monday, I would have had to go to the hospital. But I was like, you know what? I know she's gonna come when she's ready, just like Kalea. My babies just like to cook a little longer. So let it be, okay, let it be. So I had my midwife on deck. I had my doula on deck. Everybody was ready. Um, I was walking around at, the, at, at my Hope Fest and I knew that I was having contractions, but I didn't know that the real thing was really coming. So I remember my contractions were getting a little bit stronger, but they weren't necessarily getting closer. This was towards the end of the event. Um, and I decided, you know what, babe, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna call it a day. Uh, I wanna go, you know, just like take a nap and rest up because it's been a long, it's just been a long day. Um, so he was fine with that. I came home, I napped. And I remember waking up from my nap because I felt a strong contraction. I call my husband, I'm like, oh no, this is happening today. I've been here before, I know this feeling, this is happening today. So hurry it up, get over here. <laughs> um, I remember I showered. So again, like I'm literally in labor and some people are like, oh my God, you're in this dire pain for eight, nine, 12 hours. No guys, like, Honestly, there are the labor progresses and as you're getting towards the end, like towards the end, yes, it, it becomes a little bit unbearable at that point, but that's when you know that you're at the end. Everything before that is like it's if you are moving around, okay, because I can't speak to if you're sitting, laying on your back in a hospital bed. That's one thing. If you can't do absolutely anything to move around um, and move through the labor, of course, it's it's completely uncomfortable. But because I was doing this at home, I was showering, I was moving around, I was cleaning the room. Literally, I was making my bed through contractions. I was showering through contractions. I was organizing my closet through contractions, um, picking stuff up from the floor. And then the big, big contractions came. I'm talking about the ones that are about two minutes apart where you you can no longer talk through them. All you're doing is breathing through them. So I, I put everything I knew into practice at that point. So at that point, uh, I've been practicing my breathing. Yes, yes, practice the breathing, okay? At that point, I started my low groans because usually what you hear in all of the movies is that and the woman going crazy and screaming and ah, with all of the pain. You see it also on a lot of, um, you know, different people doing like birth series and all this stuff. You can go to classes to prepare. There's a lot of videos that you can watch to prepare. There is a way and there are techniques to breathing that help guide you through the labor and that actually make it um, 
make it a little bit smoother for you. So one of the things for me when it came to breathing was I knew that my breathing couldn't be high pitched. So if you think about when you do high pitch or high pitch sounds, you're actually tensing up your body. So to do that, to tense up your body when your body is trying, when your body is going through a contraction in which your muscles are already tensing, you're actually making the pain worse. So I knew that anytime I felt a contraction coming, it was actually better for me to, to breathe deep and to let out low deep groans that would allow my insides to open up, embrace the pain and let it pass. See, I'm teaching you something here. So instead of resisting the pain, the breathing techniques and the mental preparation taught me embrace it breathe into the pain don't 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 breathe out of the pain breathe into the pain embrace it and release it with every groan so that was my practice and so those low groaning vibrations actually helped um when it came to to bearing the contractions at that point so when the time did come, I'm literally like on all fours. I'm, I'm swaying back and forth. My husband is applying pressure to my back where, you know, the, the baby's beginning to turn in the birth canal as she's making her way down. So my husband was applying pressure to those areas because every time pressure is applied, it really helped release some of the pain that, that you're, that you're feeling, um, there. And, Oh my God, it just, I can remember now, just, it would feel so good whenever he would press on my back. I, I think there was one time, <laughs> he can attest to the story. There were plenty of times when he would get up, but because my contractions were so short, um, you know, I'd like be breathing at one point. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm good. I'm good, babe. But then the next one would come and I'm like, okay, okay. And if he wasn't there, I was yelling out pressure. <laughs> And wherever he was, he could hear me and he'd run in and begin to apply the pressure on the back. And it was just like a oh, sigh of relief whenever I felt that hand applying pressure on my back. Um, but once the uh, once I got to the very end, OK, the very end, because a lot of times women say, well, how do I know when it's time? Like, how do I know that the baby's coming? This was the beautiful thing about it because i remember when the midwife was there guys i lied to you not my body began to do the work on its own this is how amazing of a machine god created the woman to be i didn't have to study this i didn't have to uh, memorize a ma I didn't have a manual I didn't have a guide to tell me this is how it's gonna feel this is what you're gonna do my body when the moment came because I was doing this at home without somebody necessarily telling me hold it don't push during this contraction I need you to push right now I need you to do this right now I need you to open up your legs here right now because I I allowed my body to do this naturally because this is the whole process with home birth. It's that you are trusting your body and you are trusting your baby. And so because I allowed myself to really be led by the natural instinct, the natural mechanism of my body, when the time came, I remember looking at my midwife and saying, oh my God, my body is pushing. I was not pushing. My body was pushing the baby out. I felt when all of my abdominal muscles began to engage with one of the contractions, literally like if I could explain it, I felt like my abdominal muscles were going into a spasm. And as they were going into a spasm, I could feel the baby being pushed down. And I remember laying there on like on all fours, crouched on the floor saying, my body's pushing, my body's pushing. I don't know if I'm going to make it to the tub. And they said, with calmness, the midwife, the birth assistant, they said, we will help you get to the tub if that's where you want to have the baby. Let us know when you're ready. So, of course, I'm breathing through all of this. I'm feeling all the contractions. I'm feeling the abdominal muscles engage. I said, 
I think I'm ready, I think I'm ready. They each held my arms, they helped me into the tub between one of the contractions because as I'm feeling the contractions, I'm feeling like the baby's coming down, so I really can't move at that point. But in between the contractions, they get me into the tub. The next time I get into the tub, I literally feel the contraction coming again, and I remember saying to the midwife, it's coming again, it's coming again, my body's pushing, what do I do? Her response blew my mind. She said, do whatever you feel like doing. I mean, a doctor would never, would never tell me that. To have somebody tell me, I know that I might be the certified medic here, but I trust that your body knows how to do this more than I do. And I'm sorry that I'm getting emotional. But to hear those words coming from the person that was helping me deliver my child into the world, to hear those words empower me to do this, to hear those words give me the power back as a woman. What she was saying was, you were born to do this. You have everything on the inside of you to do this. I'm just here to support what God has already created you to do as a woman. And I remember that I took those words and I ran with them. As soon as she told me that, I said, I feel like pushing. She said, then push. I began to push. And at that moment, I remember that I felt when my baby began to drop through the canal, I felt the crowning begin. And then all of a sudden, when I felt that the abdominal muscles stopped engaging, I stopped pushing. And after about 30 seconds, I said to her, well, what do I do now? And she said, Whatever your body is telling you to do, follow your body. For about two minutes, guys, my body did absolutely nothing. I didn't feel another contraction. Um, no abdominal muscles engaged, like nothing. And, and I was kind of just there breathing, breathing. But there was, there was this relief that was running through my body. And even though I wasn't doing anything... The my baby was dropping on its own. Nade was coming down the vaginal opening on her own. My um crowning began to occur. And I remember feeling as her head was sliding down the vaginal opening. And I'm telling my midwife, I'm like, I'm not doing anything, but I feel her sliding down. And she's like, that's your body's natural way of allowing the baby to slide and it, it for the delivery process to take place without you tearing. How beautiful is that? My body was naturally crowning and allowing me to crown to the extent that I would not tear. I didn't feel another contraction. I didn't it was like my body knew we can't have her continue to push. The baby's already where it needs to be. Let's allow the child to crown in this position so that the next time she pushes, it's because the baby's ready to come out and there's not gonna be any tearing. The next time I felt the contraction come, it was not um, as strong as a contraction. I just know that I felt it coming. It was a relief to push and when I pushed that second push, baby's head came out literally dangling. Like her head was dangling out. I remember my husband, I remember yelling out, what's happening? What's happening? And my husband just saying, the head is out. Oh my God, it's a full head of hair. She's just dangling there. I'm like, ah, uh, is she going to drown? The midwife is like, no, this is perfectly normal. The next time you feel like pushing, that's going to be it. So you're going to be ready. I pushed and out come her shoulders and everything. She just slipped right out into the water. I'm grabbing her. I'm holding her. 
It was the most incredible and beautiful experience of my entire life. It's crazy because I cried talking about it, but I didn't actually cry the day that I delivered. I was so overjoyed. My emotions were like, just, I was so overjoyed that all I could do was like, oh my God! And I mean, I was like yelling and screaming with excitement and it was just, it was beautiful, it was exciting. Um, so I didn't cry. It, it was more of like a, there was an adrenaline rush that was running through my body. So needless to say, after that beautiful experience, it was gonna be no questions asked. I was definitely gonna do it again with Navaya. I remember that um, after that happened, they let me sit in the water. Uh, the placenta still needed to be delivered because it's not just the baby that gets delivered. You then eventually feel a teeny other contraction to deliver the placenta. Um, at least mine was, I'm not gonna say everybody's teeny, I don't know, but like maybe three minutes later, I felt a contraction of some sort and pushed and the placenta came out. Um, and then I remember they picked me up, held me up while I held my baby. They had towels wrapped them all around, you know, me kind of patted me down. Uh, somebody was holding the placenta in, in like a bucket while because it was attached to the baby's umbilical cord and I'm holding the baby. And I literally have like three women with me, walking with me to my bed. Everything on the bed is already ready. It's laid out. I lay down on my bed. It's, it almost became like a, like a medic's bed, you know, because they have like pads, like all of this stuff all over my bed, all of their tools and equipment. And the same stuff that gets done at the hospital with the checks, I mean, it's all the same stuff that happened, but here in the comfort of my home in my own bed. And so all of those things are taking place. Um, they're checking the baby's weight. They're checking, I mean, all of that stuff. But the beauty, beautiful thing about this is um, it's happening over a longer period of time versus when the doctors rush in and they try to do everything within five minutes and like get out. Um, they let me really hold. I, I was able to hold my baby. I think I held my baby for about 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour before like I passed her on for any type of check. So that's that's how long I had her. As a matter of fact, I think with I think with um both Nade and Avaya, I actually did breastfeeding before they even like took her to do anything. Um we made sure that that the babies were able to latch on. So that was beautiful. And um, I do remember that all the lights were dim. So none of these like hospital bright lights, like all the lights were dim. Um, they just had like these kind of like lanterns on, um, making sure everyone was like still talking in low voices. Cause mind you, it is like the middle of the night. Um, when I had Navaya, both my daughters were sleeping in the room next door and did not wake up once. <laughs> um, when I had in a day, this was about like seven in the afternoon. So, um, but Kalea was not here, but it was about seven in the afternoon. But still, you know, like they're keeping like everything quiet, soft, no one's talking. They're just letting me embrace the moment with my child and with my husband. And you know what, right after, the doula, Amy, God bless her, how she went downstairs as, as soon as I gave birth. They had brought me up a whole bowl of sancocho. My mom had made it in advance. She, we had, like, she had made it like a, a, a few days before the delivery. We had put it in the freezer because we didn't know when the baby was gonna be born. Um, but, uh, Amy had gone downstairs. She had put everything in pots, heated everything up. And like, while the baby was being checked by the midwife and the birth assistant, I was just eating my sancocho, which is what I wanted because they were like, what are you going to want? Right after the baby was born, I knew that I wanted my mom's sancocho, like, which is a healthy type of soup. It's a Dominican soup filled with all types of nutrition. So um, I was really, really fortunate to be able to have that. And then I am left alone to sleep with my daughter and my husband and no one comes back to bother me until 24 to 48 hours. I believed it was two days later. So after they did all the checks, they were like, we're gonna see you in two days. They came to check up on me 
after two days they checked up on me like a week after they did another checkup at um six weeks and then after that everything was clear and i did not have to step foot out of my house not once not twice none and so of course that's why i decided to then again do the same thing with navaya it was beautiful experience I do not regret it. I do not change it for anything, anything, anything in the world. And um, again, I'm going to say this every single time. I am not saying that home birth is for everyone. But what I am saying is that I hope that if you know of a mother that is looking at her options and she ever mentions to you home birth, that you do not look at her like she is crazy but that you empower her to make that decision because she probably has a million people that are opposing her decision. So it is so important for us as a community to empower women, especially women who are at low risk, who want to do this at home because it truly is a phenomenal, beautiful, empowering experience. So, I'm gonna leave that there. While I do believe that every woman is strong. I mean, we are strong human beings. Like, our bodies are strong, stronger than we think. Um, but like I said in my very first one, it is so important to mentally prepare. If you are going natural, the natural route, whether it's at hospital, whether it's at home, it's at a home birth center, um, you cannot do it. <laughs> I can't emphasize this enough. You cannot do this if you do not mentally prepare. It does take um, a lot of mental preparation. So that's why one of the key things that I talked about in my very first episode was mental preparation. So um, feel free to go back and watch that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This has been such a blessing to be able to share this experience with you all. I have some exciting news. So we will not be doing the home birth live next week because I um, am committed to the first Thursday of every month dedicating that to um, the women who are connected to me that I am pouring into in my girl talk. So I do girl talks once a month, the beginning of every month. If you want to be part of the girl talk, make sure that you subscribe, francescachavez.com you'll be receiving the link to join it is a private group so I don't do a live I don't make it public this is my way of pouring out to um, to the women who are connected to me on this journey this has nothing to do with home birth this is all about spiritual growth um, uh, and just empowering women, women as women. So if you haven't subscribed, do that so that you get the, the Zoom link to join that girl talk that's coming up next week. And oh, thank you, Pastor Reese. Thank you, thank you. And to all the husbands who are watching and supporting their wives, I thank you. I thank you for supporting these incredible, incredible women. Um, but on the next live, which is gonna be the week after that, my doula and Pastor Angie's doula, the amazing, wonderful Amy, will be joining to answer some of your deepest questions. So make sure that you tune in, tune in, tune in. We got we to gotta get these numbers up for Amy, all right? Because I can't have her come on here and just, give you guys all of this knowledge you know I, I want this knowledge to go out to everybody so get everybody on the chat i believe it's june 11th um but we're gonna be going live with amy and it's just gonna be an incredible awesome wonderful experience so thank you all again so much for tuning in i love you guys and until next time have a wonderful wonderful rest of the week